All right, we're recording. All right, so let me hand over the floor to uh, group number six to share with us their presentation. All right, thank you, Dr. Chom. So before we begin, we would like to extend a huge thank you to all of the team members that made this presentation possible, as well as the faculty and staff of EML 4501 and everyone else that has made it to our presentation today. We would also like to thank our corporate sponsors, Northrop Grumman, Cummins, and Carrier in support of our engineering education. So without further ado, we are group six. I'm Alexa Benezra and my group members are Luke Davis, Joe Joyce-Zinski, Uchijukwa Ilodibe, Minjay Kang, Matilde Miror, Gabriel Osejo, and Ilan Zarin. And this is our product, Sunflower Solar. Hello, I'm Joe Jarzinski. In this presentation, we will provide our design highlights, cost analysis, and important calculations to show that our design works. The Sunflower Solar Heliostat design is an automated reflective surface used to reflect solar power to a central collection tower in Las Vegas, Nevada. The customer requested a solar production of one megawatt and a solar concentration of 1,000 suns while being as cost efficient as possible. Our design consists of an anodized aluminum reflective surface moved by two DC motors welded directly to two driving power screws. The customer originally requested multiple reflective surfaces per module, but after discussing with the customer, it was decided that it would severely increase cost without increasing production. The design is supported by an aluminum monopod structure inserted one foot into the ground and buried in concrete. The two motors allow the reflective surface to track the path of the sun and at any point reflect towards the central tower. Our design provides a theoretical solar concentration ratio of 2,386 suns and a power output of 1.04 megawatts with only 417 modules. These outputs are only to provide the requested power production and can be improved with a larger solar array. Our design motivations can be seen on this side. We intended to minimize the total solar array cost while still providing at least one megawatt of power. Functionality was achieved as the array design reached the customer needs regarding concentration ratio and total power output. The total array cost was minimized by reducing the amount of modules necessary to achieve adequate power. And the assembly was proved easy to assemble as it can be assembled in 11 minutes. It is also made of 70% parts that are unmodified, and this is helpful due to recent manufacturing shortages, as most off-the-shelf parts can be found from multiple vendors if somebody has a shortage. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alon Zarin, and I will be taking us through the movement system for Sunflower Solar. So as it was mentioned before, the movement system is powered via linear actuators made of a DC motor. Uh, which is welded to a stainless steel uh, lead screw. And then the lead screws mount to brass flanges. The two linear actuators are mounted 90 degrees apart to enable rotation along the uh, two axes that are necessary to track the sun throughout the day. Uh, the motor is also motor mounted to a motor mount and the motor mount is connected with a clevis pin. Um, and so one is mounted the one motor is mounted between the upper support piece and the main vertical support. And then the second motor is mounted between the reflective surface and the upper uh, support piece. And then the flanges are mounted with a screw in either side. And this enables the flange and the motor mount to rotate, uh, enabling proper movement of the linear actuators. Uh, in order to prove that the movement system will properly function, the motor has to provide enough torque to overcome the friction and get around moving the uh, system up and down. And so we first assumed a weight seven times heavier than the expected weight to be lifted in order to uh, remain conservative in our, in our uh, calculations. And so we then found the torque that was required to raise and lower that. So as shown here, the torque required to raise the system was 46.9 newton centimeters. And then the motor was selected to ensure ample torque, 
we eventually selected a motor that has 150 newton centimeters, which is more than three times the torque required that we calculated, which is in turn, uh, which was in turn found by um, uh, as, uh, expecting a weight that was already heavier than our final weight was. And so this means that the selected movement system will work and it will uh, not, and that it'll help to um, ensure motor, uh, an extended motor lifetime. And then we also perform calculations to determine the basis stress on the uh, threads. And so on the first thread of engagement, the stress will be approximately uh, 36 megapascals, which is far below the yield strength of both stainless steel and brass. And then uh, another aspect is that um, because of how it moves throughout the day, those stresses will only be involved while the system is in motion, which is only for about 70 seconds of each day. Hi, my name is Luke Davis. I'll be taking you guys through the support, through the support um, subsystem. Our design is supported by a monopod, which, is, which means that a, a singular leg is used to support the rest of the structure. The reason why we went with a monopod instead of other ideas like a tripod, a lumber frame, or a truss was because a monopod was found to be cheaper, more compatible with other, subsystems, with other subsystems, and requiring less welding, with welds being potential failure points over the lifetime of the heliostat. The support subsystem consists of the monopod, which is made up of a three foot long, one inch by one inch square tube with one 27 inch thick walls, four four inch crossbars for additional support, an L bracket attached to the monopod by a clevis pin that, as Alon stated, allows the reflective surface to be adjusted along two different axes uh, and two U brackets uh, for the flanges that are attached to the monopod by rivets. The bottom of the monopod and the four crossbars are buried one foot into the ground to allow the weight of the dirt to keep the heliostat firmly in place, with concrete poured on top of, uh, on top of the dirt to increase the support even further. All the square tubes and brackets that we used are made up of 6063 T6 aluminum, since aluminum is a weather-resistant and appropriately strong material. 6063 T6 aluminum, in particular, was used due to its easy weldability and corrosion-resistant properties. Our design incorporates a safety configuration to prevent failure due to high wind speeds. In this configuration, the heliostat goes completely horizontal to minimize the surface area compared to the wind load. Um, it was found that the system would sway at 58 miles per hour and it would tip over at 118 miles per hour. To avoid this and be extra cautious, the design enters the safety configuration mode at 29 miles per hour. You can go to the next slide. Since we use hollow square tubes instead of solid bars to lower costs, um, we wanted to confirm that the 63 aluminum was up to the task that we, uh, uh, so, so we performed a calculation of the stress that the monopod would be under with the assumed weight of 30 pounds. After subtracting the area of the cut section from the total cross-sectional area and dividing the force by it, we found out, we found out that the stress that the monopod was under was just 2.12 megapascals, which is way lower than the, than the yield stress of the aluminum, which was, which was under 60 megapascals. We also performed, we also performed analysis for the, for the support critical load. Uh, this is because the support is not in simple compression as the heliostat moves throughout the day. The critical load was found, uh, sorry, the critical load is necessary to place a column in a state of unstable equilibrium, which can cause a column to collapse if it is crooked or moved. The Euler uh, column formula was utilized with, with end condition of 0 0.25 to account for the column being free on one end. The dimensions and area of the support were used to calculate the radius of gyration, which is the K value, which was then plugged into the critical load equation along with the modulus elasticity of the aluminum uh, and also the, uh, the end conditions constant. The critical load was found to be 513 newtons, which is, which is below the estimate, the high estimate of 133.4 newtons. So the st support will be in equilibrium. And the wind failure analysis was done by using the center of gravity to find the tipping angle, finding the ground pressure using depth and density, and then using a moment equation to calculate the wind force necessary to achieve that angle. 
Uh, it was it was found that the force from the wind to tip it would be 3,556 newtons, and this equates to a velocity of 118 miles per hour. Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Chikri and I'm going over the reflective surface of assembly. So this system is made up of three layers. The first layer is anodized aluminum, 20 gauge sheet metal, followed by an aluminum honeycomb structure, which is a quarter inch thick. And then lastly, you have corrugated polypropylene layer, which is four millimeters or 0.157 inches thick. So the entire thickness is 0.44 inches with a reflective surface area of one meter square. So we added the honeycomb structure and corrugated plastic layer to add stiffness to the sub-assembly and reduce the bending um, by the aluminum mirror. Also, the corrugated plastic layer prevents tiny insects and critters from getting into the small holes of our honeycomb structure. Also, this plastic acts as an insulator to protect the computer system and the motion system from transmitted heat through the surface of the reflector. Um, additionally, the entire effective surface of assembly protects other components like the motors, the motion system, the screws, and the computers from rain and other weather conditions. So, we plan on having this anodized mirror outsourced to a manufacturer called Alano Technology. But if we were to assemble a prototype, we have identified an in house manufacturing process. Of the mirror. So the first step would be to degrease the sheet metal in trichloroethylene or TCE. Um, TCE is a common cleaning agent and is used to remove oil and dirt and other substances from the surface of material. Um, then the sheet metal will be further cleaned with an alkaline cleaner and then rinsed with cold water to get off, off, get off all the chemicals from the surface. On the next stage, we have the machining and edge polishing stage where we polish the surface, only one surface of the aluminum mirror. Um, that way we reduce the roughness and enhance the effectivity of the mirror. And so in order to protect this reflective po polished layer, we take it and put the entire um, sheet metal in an electrolytic vacuum bath of 15% sulfuric acid saturated with um, carbon dioxide. So the sheet metal acts as an anode, and then a separate cathode is placed in the same bath after which a direct current is passed through the system. So the electrochemical reactions create pores on the surface of the, of the sheet and allows the aluminum to bond with oxygen in the reaction, which forms aluminum oxide and helps create a protective layer on our reflective surface. So this um, layer increases abrasion resistance and is necessary for parts that have to withstand extreme temperatures and chemical exposure, which in our case, since our system will be in Las Vegas, will be very beneficial. So the final stage of the anodization process is to seal these pores to prevent contaminants and other like impurities from getting into the surface and to maintain the high reflectivity. So we do this by um, placing the entire system or the entire mirror in a hot water bath of 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And then this entire process takes about 55 minutes to an hour. So as a result of this anodization process, the surface now has a polished finish. Um, and this creates a reflection of a nearly real image um, and we can compare the solar absorptivity of unpolished and dull aluminum to the absorptivity of polished and anodized aluminum. And we see that the anodized surface has a much lower absorptivity than the dull surface because um, the anodization process has smoothed out almost all the imperfections on the surface, which decreases absorptivity. So as previously mentioned, a reflective surface is composed of three layers, the third of which is an insulated plastic layer. So we can follow the equation here that relates absorptivity, which is denoted alpha, reflectivity, which is denoted rho, and transmissivity, which is denoted tau. And since there is no, no radiation that is transmitted through the reflective surface, this means that the transmissivity value is equal to zero. And as a result, the reflectivity is an inverse of the absorptivity. And since polishing and anodizing the surface 
have decreased absorptivity, therefore the reflectivity value is higher. Um, so not only does this process increase the amount of radiation that's reflected, but it also makes the reflection more accurate. When you look at a dull surface up close, it's rough and uneven, which exhibits properties of diffuse reflection, which would increase the tracking area error, sorry, which would increase the tracking error and also lower the overall thermal power of the array. And so a smoother surface might be considered a more specular surface in which the reflection angle is more equal to the incident angle. So therefore the tracking that we, the low tracking error that we desire is um, more achievable. Next slide. So in regards to heat transfer of the reflective surface, we performed two calculations for the two extremes in temperatures that occur throughout the year. Um, the total heat transfer rate is for one individual heliostat, and this takes into account the radiative and the convective heat transfer. We assumed that the only element that is transferring heat to the surface is the sun through black body radiation. Um, so we set the ambient temperature equal to the surrounding temperature since the surface is placed in an infinite space. And as a result, we got the high and low radiative heat transfer values of 115.2 watts and 88 watts, and the high and low convective heat transfer values of 289 watts and 149 watts. And these all add up to the total heat transfer values for the high and low ambient temperatures of 404.2 watts and 237 watts. Next slide. Hello, my name is Mathilde Miroir, and I will be going over the solar array design layout with you. Um, our entire solar array consists of 417 heliostat modules arranged in 12 rows, ranging from 20 meters to 46.5 meters away, um, with alternate spacing of 3.5 and 1.5 meters. This is, this is to allow for minimized shading effects between the rows, but also to allow for commercial trucks to pass through and service the individual heliostats and wash them. So the customer needs originally indicated a 100 meter tower as the maximum, um, but after a more in-depth discussion with our customer um, on the priorities of this design project with our, uh, some design constraints were altered to produce a more efficient design. So the tower height was reduced to about 26 meters. This allowed us to bring all of the rows of heliostat forward and reduce the outward sprawl from the tower base. And it resulted in a more efficient use of land and improved overall functionality of the array. Um, overall, this entire design was de developed to be effective uh, for the customer needs required under the worst operating conditions in terms of season, uh, that being winter, where the sun is just south of the tower and causes a shadow that actually moves across the array throughout the day. Um, using geometry, we found that the shadow only covered about two to three heliostats at any one time, and we deemed that this was acceptable given that the number of heliostats we had chosen was already an overestimate because we had done so many calculations considering the worst case scenario for all of these circumstantial variables in which the heliostat would operate. Um, you'll notice that the arc of rows, like patterned out forward from the array or from the receiver is focused around the north side of the tower. Uh, this is because it improves the overall efficiency of each of the heliostats as the incident angle hitting each heliostat is drastically reduced. Um, unlike what it would be if the heliostat was on the south or the east or west side of the tower. Um, so we wanted to get the biggest bang for our buck and focus all of them on the north side so we didn't need as many heliostats um, to do a poorer job. Uh, this was confirmed by higher level research papers and simulations published in academic journals that we came across in our research. Okay, so um, initially when developing our system, we determined a preliminary receiver area constrained by the operable area range that the farthest heliostat could point within. Um, we realized that a significant order of heliostats was necessary to achieve the um, required solar concentration ratio, uh, something on the order of 2,000 heliostats, which just was unrealistic and drastically threw our overall cost out of proportion. So we considered minimizing the receiver area to improve the solar concentration ratio while minimizing the reduction in power output. This was done by performing an analysis of the Gaussian distribution of the beams across the receiver area 
to find an efficient proportional relationship between the reduction in the receiver area, the improvement in the solar concentration ratio, and the minimal reduction in power output. Um, but something we needed to consider while doing all these calculations was that reducing the receiver area means that we reduce the effective number of heliostats reflecting to the receiver. Um, after further calculation and analysis, we determined that the optimal reduction in area was about 16%. Uh, this improved the solar concentration ratio from 381 with 417 heliostats to well over 2,386. And it only reduced the power output from 1.148 megawatts to 1.036 megawatts. So we still achieved our customer needs. Um, and the effective number of heliostats on the array was only reduced from 417 to 376 heliostats given the reduction in receiver area. Uh, these three equations for the optimal efficiency, power output, and solar concentration ratio were the governing equations that we used to lay out our solar array. The optical efficiency was calculated using the worst case scenario um, for all of the variable conditions in which the, uh, the heliostats would operate um, that we, just, we uncovered in research journals that we had come across in our research. Uh, the power output being 1.036 megawatts was a very conservative value since we considered the variation in cosine losses throughout the array um, by choosing different heliostats as they were different distances from the central receiver and seeing what their cosine losses would be and then averaging them. Um, and we also considered the variation in cosine losses throughout the day uh, by accounting for different in, a range of incident values um, that the solar radiance would experience as it hit the individual heliostat. Hi, my name is Minjay Kang, and I'll talk about the computer system with its waterproofing case. The computer system involves an Arduino Uno to control the to control the motors and L293D motor shield, which allows the Arduino to control the motors, and an ABS plastic case. We can technically control up to four motors with the L293D motor shield which means one computer system can potentially control up to two, two modules. However, due to the complexity of the, due to the complexity of the, of the wiring, it can cause while not significantly reducing the price, only one computer will be used per module. The computer system is going to be inside a case to prevent the computer from malfunctioning due to environmental contamination, such as dust and rain. However, having a case will cause the temperature inside the case to rise due to lack of ventilation. Due to this reason, an estimation of the computer temperature had to be done to ensure that the overheating of the computer did not occur. The maximum operable temperature of the Arduino Uno was found to be 85 degrees Celsius. Finding the max temperature of the computer was consisted of two steps. First, a heat transfer analysis to find the max temperature inside the case, then a thermodynamics analysis to find the max temperature that the computer will reach. First, the heat transfer analysis was performed to find the temperature inside the case. As shown in the, the thermal circuit in the slide, the temperature of the external surface was first found with the ambient temperature and the thermal resistances due to radiation and convection. Then with the external surface temperature and the thermal resistance due to conduction, the internal, internal surface temperature was found. And finally, the temperature inside the case was found using the internal surface temperature and the thermal resistances due to radiation and convection inside the case. With the temperature inside the case found, a closed system analysis using the first law of thermodynamics was performed to find the max temperature of the Arduino Uno. With the heat transfer analysis, the temperature inside the case was found to be 48.74 degrees Celsius. And with that temperature, utilizing the first law, the max temperature of the Arduino Uno was found to be 73.74 degrees Celsius which was well below the maximum operable temperature of 85 degrees Celsius. 
Hello everyone, I'm Gabriel Sejo and I'll be going over the cost overview. The total cost for one module would be $168.81. A majority of this cost is coming from our OTS parts, which is $103.27. Despite this high value, we were able to drastically reduce this cost through purchasing these parts directly from the suppliers at bulk prices. Our assembly cost is $10.76 per module. We were able to get the assembly labor cost to the use of Boothroyd and the Hearst estimation techniques. With these charts, we were able to estimate an assembly time of 11 minutes and 23 seconds. By taking the average factory employee pay of $56.74 an hour and dividing it by our time estimation is how we got an assembly labor cost of $10.76. This hourly pay of $57.74 was found by adding the medium hourly wage a factory employee, which was $16.21, with the possible benefits that this, this employee can earn, which is estimated to be about 30 to 50% of the mean hourly wage, and overhead costs, which was estimated to be 200% of the mean hourly wage. These estimations, as well as the $16.21 that was used, were values that were all provided with this course. Finally, the manufacturing labor cost is $54.78 per module. This cost was found through processing, processes costing tables. These costing tables tabulated the unit cost of manufacturing processes. By adding all of these unit costs together of the manufacturing process needed in our design is how we got the value of $54.78. Next slide, please. We believe that Sunflower Solar should be prototyped since this design reaches all the customer needs in terms of solar production. It is also a very simple design to build since less than 30% of our parts need to be modified. In addition, since most of our manufacturing process required can be done in the University of Florida, there'll be a minimal need to outsource any of this work. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation and please feel free to ask any questions that you have at this time. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so that was 27 minutes. Um, so we've got a good amount of time for questions uh, and technical discussion with the panel. I've got one. <clears throat> oh, you ready? So you mentioned that you, so first off, I really liked the idea where you're like, oh, we're going to put corrugated plastic underneath the aluminum honeycomb to keep critters from nesting in the honeycomb. However, can critters also nest inside of the corrugated plastic? Yes. So they could. So yes, they could, but we could they could from the side, but we could also seal the ends of the of the corrugated plastic and um that's that's an easy fix. I just I just noticed that and went. Well, you solved one problem, but created the identical problem just in a different direction. Um, so I have that one. And then um, for your electronics, for the Arduinos and everything like that, um, I might have missed it. Um, but what, what are you taking into consideration for um, environmental protection of your electronics? They're going to be out in the rain, wind, dust. Critters again. It's just an ABS plastic case. So it's mainly for the dust in, dust in the desert and possible rain. So we also have silicon bellows over the motors under the relay set. So when I'm looking at this right now, you've got two decent size openings in your ABS case, what's going to prevent things from getting into your electronics? Um, the only, the only where I can see us reducing the, um, the ability of other insects or bugs getting into the, the reflective surface is or to the computer system is to reduce the size of these holes because we need these holes for the wires to get through and control the motor. So there's, that's why these holes are here. So there's no complete way to, you know, get rid of all these holes completely. You can only make them smaller. 
or you can seal them. Or you could have an electrical connector that's coming out that's a waterproof, weatherproof electrical connector. Or you have a cover that gets screwed on that has an O-ring to seal over it. There, there's, a, there's a couple of different options here. I'm just, I'm pointing it out as a concern because the desert is dusty and dust equals static and static equals dead electronics. Also dust equals dead electronics. You can ask like 80% of the things that I've ever owned in my life. So, but I'll let, I'll let the rest of the panel take it away. Those were just my two things that I wanted to bring up with you guys. In regards to Tom Singer's uh, comment in the chat, um, is that an observation or do you want me to go back and show how we laid it out? Because the plastic is just for the honeycomb. Oh, no, that was just a joke. He used the honeycomb to close out the plastic and then he used more oh. to close out the honeycomb. Yeah, no, that, that, was, that was very irreverent. I, I apologize for that. Um, I. I came in, uh, it, it's turtles all the way down. Um, I came in a little bit late, so uh, I apologize. I missed uh, probably the first two thirds of the presentation. Um, and uh, and so if there was a fem in there, I apologize. I, I can't rip you to shreds for having a fem in there uh, if I didn't see it. So, uh, But I, I will, uh, I'll say when you're doing your electronics analysis, you're showing a, a maximum temperature of what, like 77 degrees Celsius or something like that. Uh, compared to a, a maximum allowable temperature, yeah, 73 compared to a maximum allowable of 85 Celsius. Um, what is the lifetime when you're getting that close to the uh, maximum allowable temperature? Uh, and, and what do you expect to happen with, uh, with thermal cycling when you're going from, uh, you know, the heat of the day to, you know, desert nights get fairly cold, as, as I understand, and, and certainly you wouldn't be operating at night, um, but uh, you're, you're going to be having those thermal cycles anyway. I think the maximum operable temperature ranges from negative 20 degrees Celsius to 85 degrees Celsius. So I don't think the, the temperature will get below that. So that's not a problem, but also the 73.74 degrees Celsius is an overestimate because I assumed the whole mass of the Arduino Uno and the Warner Shield was the electronic. So it's probably going to be a lot lower than that. OK, yeah, I'd, I'd just, uh, I'd, I'd wonder. Um, again, about lifetime, right? If, if this thing is intended to last for 20 years, 20 years of, of you know, swinging up to 73 degrees Celsius and then back down to, uh, you know, a cold night in, in the desert might be, uh, you know, getting close to zero degrees Celsius, I guess, on, on some nights. So I, I just wonder what that would do to the lifetime of the electronics. So the Arduino company says that they guarantee will run for at least 6,000 hours at 105 degrees Celsius, which our, our computer will only go up to 73.74. And it's not going to be operating all the time as the company mentioned. So I th think it will be okay. Okay, yeah, just something something to, to think about going forward. Thank you. Could 
Did you guys go to where you talk about the solar layout and the tower height? So, and and I'm, I'm sorry, kind of like Tom, I, I was in, in and out of this presentation due to uh, a, a work-related matter. Um, but uh, could you explain why you chose 26 meters? I know you were given the leeway of choosing anything between up to 100 meters. Why 26? Yes, so I... Um... I created an Excel document that sort of iteratively like simulated what it would be like if the tower were different heights um, for a range of heliostat positions away from the tower. And I sort of um, initially for my first calculation, it was sort of guess and check, like what could get me within the range of the solar concentration ratio I like and the power output that I needed. And then from there, I got within, um, it was within 20 to I think 30 is what I wanted my tower to be. And from there, I then sort of tried to figure out, okay, so how many heliostats do I need? And then I iteratively calculated like the summation of the power output from each row. And from there, I got to row 12. And so this is sort of how my calculations ran. Um, the row distance from the heliostat uh, of the heliostat from the receiver, the heliostat modules in row, and the heliostat modules in the sum of the rows. So every row before that and that row. Um, and then I sort of, it, again, it was like, I had like a base calculator that I made to sort of get within the range. And then I just had to narrow the number down. And I found that when you get so much farther away from the tower and the tower is so tall, your cosine losses go through the roof. And we wanted to minimize that as much as possible to get as efficient a heliostat array as our solar array as we could. So minimizing the tower height, minimizing the distance from the tower was the best thing that we could do. Okay, good. And then uh, if you go, could go to your cost slide. So uh, me and Tom were chatting a little bit through this on IM. Uh, the assembly time, how, how do you get uh, that, that? That seems ambitious. Uh, for the assembly times, we use the Boothroyd and Dewhurst approximation uh, method where it involves a certain amount of time uh, for picking up and handling the, each part, as well as a certain amount of time for inserting it into place, and then another uh, amount of time for actually uh, uh, securing it to whatever it's being secured in, whether that is uh, in the case of rivets, using a rivet gun on it, or if it's a screw, uh, threading it in. And so using that method, we were able to uh, approximate it to that time. Okay, so, so how many total parts do you have for, for, for your design here? Just, just approximate, it doesn't have to be an exact number. I'm just it's curious. about 30, or no, it's about 27 or 28 in like individual parts and then there are some plurals of each one. I, I believe in, in total, it's roughly, it's between 60 and 70, I, I wanna say. Okay, yeah, I, I just think if, if, you're, if you're providing instructions about how to go about assembling this, and, and again, maybe on a production line. Uh, people yeah, are, the, the, sorry, not to ahead. cut you off. I believe that right. it is a uh, production line in a factory. So a factory worker working, eight hours a day performing it. So in terms of us, if we were prototyping or um, if, if we were to not assemble it, let's say, and instead ship parts to customers and customers have to assemble it, the time would definitely be, uh, would, would definitely increase a lot. Um, however, the fact that it's at 11 minutes on a production scale means that even if you know, even if the average person who would be assembling this is taking, I don't know, six times longer, it's still about an hour for one. And if it was a, 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 a layman putting it together, presumably they would not be putting together all that many, or if they were at a certain point, they would start to be able to get their speed down as well. Okay. And, and then finally, uh, your, your cost. Obviously, the goal was to drive it as close to 100 as possible. Did you talk a little bit to some of the trade-offs uh, you did 
or early on to, to get the cost of where, where you got it? Like, well, how, how did you choose, it, you know, this I've got to have, um, and so therefore I'm going to take the, the pain of the cost of that uh, versus, I, it, you know, wh where did you make your trade-offs? Was it mainly the motors or, or some, some other area? Uh, I believe that in order to reduce costs, um, I, I know that we we kind of went through to look at what fasteners especially could get uh, removed, but obviously that's only saving uh, cents here and there. Um, a large part is looking for uh, alternative uh, suppliers for motors and uh, looking for other methods uh, of acquiring them. So in terms of our linear actuator especially. We initially wanted to purchase linear actuators, but they're very expensive uh, on their own. So we ended up going to manufacturing them uh, in terms of uh, how, how we ended up eventually decided on doing it with a, a just electric DC motor uh, coupled with a lead screw. And then in addition, another aspect that we focused on was that um, of course, lowering the individual module cost is uh, great and very useful. However, if your array requires 1,000 modules or 2,000 modules, then that cost doesn't really matter because in order to get it up to scale, you need to spend more money. So we also determined that by having even a, an increased cost, but decreasing the amount of land required and decreasing the number of modules required would reduce that overall cost, which is truly, you know, the, the end goal would have to be to get the, the cost for the array lower, not the, the cost per individual module. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Okay, uh, we've got about three minutes, so probably time for one more question and answer. All right, I got one. Uh, uh, Fred Benden, Carrier Corporation. Uh, I uh, can we go back to the um, efficiency? You talk about the radiation. I didn't quite get that. I'll be honest. So if you could explain it again. But it looks like the. Am I on the right slide? Yes. So it looks like the convection heat. Is greater than the radiation heat. Am I reading that right? Um, yes, that's that was what we calculated. So um, there was a couple of assumptions that um, that I made because I wasn't really sure how to find um, the surface temperature of the reflective surface. So um, for the low ambient temperature, I assumed a surface temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And then for the high ambient temperature of 117 degrees, we assume, or I assumed um, a surface temperature of 90 degrees, which those were just uh, sort of random assumptions. And that might have been why um, some of the values are you know, different what, from what you might expect. Yeah, I was just surprised to see that the convection energy was higher than the radiation energy. So that's sort of what the technology is trying to do. So I don't have a fix for you, but I was just a little puzzled by this. So thank you. Okay, yeah. And also addressing um, Dr. Trom's question in the chat, using the ambient temperature, that's just the, like the temperature of the outside, like the ceramic temperature. So I guess what I what I'm asking is what what is this surface radiating to? Is it are you're you're assuming that it's just radiating up to the sky at ambient temperature or like the ground at ambient temperature? That's normally when you when you do a radiation calculation, you've got two surfaces that are that are thermally talking to each other, and so I get one of them is the surface temperature of the heliostat, but then the other surface temperature I was I was 
Oh, so it's T, T sub S is the surface temperature and then T sur is like the surrounding temperature. Um, and the surrounding temperature is just the same as the ambient temperature. I just denoted them differently. Yeah, that's okay. Um, okay, so th that at least explains what it is. Um, yeah, th there might be a, a more more sophisticated way to to have to have done this, but um, okay, that that at least explains how you did it. Okay, um, and then oh, okay, uh, Carlos, you can ask. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't want to spend any more time on this, but. Um, I was wondering what what's the voltage on the motors you're using? I think it's twelve volts for Arduino. I mean, Arduino can power twelve volts. And... Okay, okay. Um, so I'm asking because it looks like the L two nine three D can power up to 10 volts and 600 milliamps per channel. I was wondering what the maximum current draw would be uh, when the motors are pushed to their limits almost. But uh, my other question was, um, how, how are we getting the DC power to begin with to power the Arduino? Is that something even important, Dr. Trump? Or like to get DC power from the AC power grid? Yeah, that so in, in interactions with the customer, um, they're gonna have access to a, a conventional AC power grid. Um, but yeah, they, they do have to worry about how to get the power from AC into you know, whatever form it needs to be to drive their system. In terms of powering the Arduino, I think we could just run wires from the surface to go to the side that has the um, so we could just run wires to the computer from the monopod and cable manage on top of or at the bottom of the effective surface. Also, I think the 293D can provide up to 36 volts and a peak output current of two amps. So I'm not sure what the 10 volts were. Sorry about that. I was I was muted on accident. Um, okay, yeah, no, I mean, I think I might be looking at the wrong one then. But uh, yeah, that's that's no problem at all. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add as well that the motors selected can run uh, with from anywhere from five to uh, twelve volts. Obviously, with with five volts, it won't be able to. It won't have as much torque. Um, but as we showed in our calculations for those, we we selected a motor which has much more torque uh, than necessary. So even if you uh, reduce that voltage, it still should have enough torque to raise the system. So. Nice, thank you. All right, great. Um, so we're we're actually a minute or two over our forty-five minute mark now. So um, let's uh, call it quits there. Um, so I want to thank. Uh, Group number six for sharing their design with us uh, and sticking around a couple extra minutes. I know that the official class time is now um, well elapsed, but really appreciate you guys giving your, your presentation and spending your afternoon with us and sharing with us your ideas. Um, that wraps up at least today's session. Um, so I'm going to stop recording.